Environmental racism and injustice are unfortunately nothing new to Philadelphia. Now we are looking at the intersection of race, ethnicity and the climate crisis. And we start with the heat. As our average temperature keeps going up, the impact across the city is not equal. Some communities of color are double digits hotter than mostly white neighborhoods. NBC 10 and Telemundo 62's Violet Ias takes us to what's called a mini heat island. Priscilla Johnson works hard to keep her street clean. The block captain has lived in the Hunting Park neighborhood for more than 30 years. And over those years, she's noticed something making her work harder to complete. The heat is very overwhelming over this area. It's just extremely hot. Priscilla's right. Compared to some other parts of Philadelphia, Hunting Park is hotter. The neighborhood is considered a mini urban heat island. These are formed when trees and grass are replaced by the concrete, asphalt, and other hard surfaces that absorb heat during the day and release it at night so the area doesn't cool down. Research shows this effect makes Hunting Park 20 degrees hotter than some other parts of the city. According to a city report, more than 75% of the neighborhood is covered by buildings, roads, and paved surfaces compared to 52% in Philadelphia overall. I used to have a tree here. It used to be trees all up and down this block. Tree covering in Priscilla's neighborhood is only 9% compared to 19% in Philadelphia and 48% in Chestnut Hill. Philly has a heat disparity, right? So there's an unequal distribution of heat in our city. It has nothing to do with where the sun is or where the clouds are. Cheyenne Flores is with Philadelphia's Office of Sustainability. She worked on the city's Beat the Heat Hunting Park report. Flores says along with Hunting Park, Point Breeze, Strawberry Mansion and Cobbs Creek are other literal hotspots in the city, and they all have something in common. Those neighborhoods are primarily black and brown. She says institutional racism has led to environmental inequity and injustice, including policies that for decades have forced people of color to live in certain areas of the city. It's like redlining have kept certain people out of certain neighborhoods, certain resources out of other neighborhoods, creating many urban heat islands. She says these neighborhoods have more pollution producing industries that also contribute to the higher temperatures. We're seeing the majority of these neighborhoods that are so hard hit by environmental injustices, such as being sited near a gas plant or a refinery, being sited near lots of auto shops. On top of this, climate change is making it hotter. Since 1970, the average temperature in the summer in Philadelphia has gone up three degrees. For the average to go up by three degrees, it means that the, re the temperatures that we are experiencing are going up potentially by a lot more. Enrique Kirchitzer is a professor at the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University. He says Philadelphia needs to fix its infrastructure and find ways to cool the heat islands. Unless um, there is a significant investment in um, for mitigation in those neighborhoods, we, we will see um, significant problems um, in the city. Over here as well, that they have people come around and build. The city and Drexel University have installed benches and flower beds in Hunting Park, adding efforts to keep people cool. It's going to be umbrella on these benches here. It's a start, but a lot more needs to be done. Johnson believes the best way to get more help is to get neighbors involved. If you don't step up and say something and you're actually living in it and you're around it, who will? From Hurricane Sandy to Tropical Storm Issa, yes, we're seeing weather bringing more severe downpours throughout our area, and one Philly community continues to get walloped by flooding. Residents say they're worried no one is listening to their concerns. NBC 10's Claudia Vargas has the story of the Eastwick neighborhood. The green debris on Leo Brundage's shed door is a flood remnant from last August. So the water came up to that? that oh, yeah, oh yeah. Leo took these pictures. The silver structure to the right is the same shed with the debris. The water also went inside his home. The water was up to here. He had to replace furniture and appliances. I lost over uh, about $60,000 on it. City officials confirmed that more than four feet of water took over parts of Eastwick. It's a Southwest Philadelphia neighborhood built on marshland. It won't be the last time it sees so much rain and flooding, and it's not just an Eastwick problem. According to the nonprofit group Climate Central, Philly has a nearly 50% chance of getting four foot floods once a year until 2030. The likelihood increases the next decade, 
By 2050, it's almost guaranteed that such floods will happen annually. Scientists at Climate Central say it's a result of the planet getting hotter. The warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture, and that translates very directly into um, bigger downpours. Eastwick is surrounded by two creeks and the Schuylkill River, plus the Delaware River is close by. It's going to be harder for the water to get out of those creeks and rivers, so you're going to have more tendency for the water back up and have more flooding. So with bigger storms and water levels rising, parts of Eastwick are in trouble. The majority of residents who live there are black middle class. You know, our structural racism plays itself out, you know, in issues like this. You know, you have upstream development that is largely white and wealthy and downstream development. Michael Naren is an urban studies professor at Penn. He explains Eastwick is a downstream development. He and other experts say the overdevelopment upstream in the mostly white suburbs doesn't allow for some of the water to be absorbed naturally. And so it just shoots down here to Eastwick, eventually overflowing. During the August storm, Cobbs Creek grew seven feet higher than usual up in the suburbs. By the time it neared Eastwick, it was 12 feet higher than usual. Naren says that's detrimental to this community in more ways than one, including an inability to transfer wealth to the next generation. They can't get the value out of their homes because of the flooding. The community has been asking for years for the city to help with the flooding. I don't want to go nowhere, but I want this fixed. But a fix is likely a long ways away. We spoke with the city's floodplain manager, Josh Leipert. Is there anything you guys can actually do to try to stop some of that flooding right now? There's there's no there's no short term solutions to stop flooding. Um, this is a, a natural floodplain. The city engaged the Army Corps of Engineers with a long term plan study. Whether it's elevations of homes, um, it's buyouts of homes, relocations of properties. The study would offer recommendations, and then the city would work with the residents on actual solutions another multi-year process. Back on Saturn Place, where Leo Brundage has lived for more than 30 years, he says the flooding has worsened each decade. Has the flooding gotten more intense or more frequent? More intense. But he says he still loves living there. It's beautiful here. He just wants the flooding to be addressed. With climate change, that will be more of a challenge. From pollen to pollution, the numbers don't lie. More black and Latinx people suffer from asthma than other groups. In his latest budget address, Philly Mayor Jim Kenney dedicated $1 million to improve air quality in the city. This comes after years of significant racial and ethnic disparities. NBC10 and Telemundo 62's Isabel Sanchez walks us through how climate change can make those disparities worse. Jenny Lucerna lives for days like these, playing outdoors with her grandchild. But the outdoors can severely upset her asthma. Imagine not being able to breathe. That means Jenny always has her big bag close by. So this is what I have to carry with me every day. My inhaler, my allergy pills, my EpiPen. You never know what to expect. So um, I can have a day where I decide to take a walk at a trail and let's say I didn't check the allergy forecast for that day and then I all of a sudden start to get shortness of breath. Asthma is a chronic lung disease where airways get narrow when inflamed, making it very hard to breathe. Jenny is one of the more than 1.3 million Pennsylvanians suffering for the disease. Their incidence of asthma in the general population varies based on race. My name is Gustavo Fernandez Romero. I am an assistant professor at Temple University Hospital. Dr. Romero points out Puerto Ricans and African Americans are particularly vulnerable to asthma. According to a study by the University of Pittsburgh, the rates for asthma for Puerto Ricans are 16%, 11% for African Americans, and 7.7% for whites. There's lack of access to care in the minority community, lack of access to a specialist, especially for kids and adults uh, for asthma care lack of education. I'm Dr. Juanita Mora, allergist and immunologist at Chicago Allergy Center. Dr. Mora says the socioeconomic reality of these communities makes the asthma problem worse. They're more likely to live near the chemical plants, near where smog levels are really, really high. Smog, also called ozone, is a highly irritating gas. The American Lung Association gives Philly a NEF grade for its ground level ozone. So what is it about Philadelphia that makes it so bad? Well, uh, there are about 7 million people who live in the metro area. So those folks in the course of their daily lives, they make a lot of air pollution in their travel and in their industries. But 
Philadelphia also is downwind from other upwind sources. This is Kevin Stewart. I'm director of environmental health with the American Lung Association. He says pollution traveling from Western PA and even not from Washington, D.C. impacts Philadelphia. Another major impact is climate change. Higher temperatures as a result of climate change help make more ozone in the atmosphere. Experts say the higher temps mean we're going to see more pollen because the growing season is getting longer. And severe weather events such as wildfire smoke and flooding won't help either. We know that uh, underserved populations live in substandard housing sometimes, that uh, where water invades and then mold can form. Mold also is a trigger for people with asthma. We live near the L, so we had the L pass by every day. I mean, you have all the factories in that area. So you see the pollutants. Jenny grew up in the heart of the Puerto Rican barrio in North Philadelphia. There, her asthma was hard to control, forcing her to move to a section of the city that is more open and has less traffic. I definitely, definitely think it was a big impact on me getting better. I was wondering if Dr. Goldstein was available. She also makes regular doctor visits, getting allergy shots and using technology to prevent asthma attacks. Well, there's a pollen app right here, so you just press it and it has your area. By managing her asthma, Jenny gets to spend more time outside with her grandkid. Everyone's asthma journey is different. Everyone has different types of asthma, but there's always help. There's not a cure, but there's help. As the Atlantic Ocean devours more shoreline thanks to climate change, experts predict 300,000 people could move inland, seeking refuge in the Philly area. The migration has some communities of color concerned. They're already feeling the encroachment of gentrification. NBC 10 and Telemundo 62's Brian Mendoza now telling us what the influx of new residents could mean for those neighborhoods. Sites of new construction in Philadelphia are becoming a new norm, especially in areas of communities of color, leaving many concerned about their future. My biggest concern is that I will be taxed out too. And you will um, have to sell your home. And I will have to sell my home and maybe move somewhere else that I don't feel comfortable or safe. Homeowner Lisa Seguera has lived in the Norris Square area for over three decades. Her community has seen gentrification over the recent years and their taxes increase. 2016 or 17, it's when it started going up to 400 and now it's to $700 and we're in 2021. Segura's fears of gentrification may be compounded by climate change. Research shows Americans who reside along the coastal areas looking to avoid sea level rise will move inland to cities like Philadelphia. Philly to the whole metropolitan area could see an increase of about 300,000 people uh, moving into it by the end of the century because of climate change, because of sea level rise. Matt Hauer is a professor at Florida State University. Hauer says people from Boston, New York, and D.C. could head this way. But he also says about 160,000 people will move out of Philly, leaving the net change of around 140,000 people. But it's who may be coming and going that's raising concerns about affordable housing. Those who are most likely to move are those with the means to be able to move. If that is the case, either populations are going to be completely displaced or we need to have an active uh, planning process uh, to make sure that the city is developed in a way that is equitable. Michelle Carrera is the executive director of Norris Square Community Alliance. It's a community development corporation with a mission to improve the neighborhood. She says the area has caught the attention of new home developers. We have seen a big change, um, especially in our, in our communities of color. Carrera says many neighbors bought their homes years ago for around $30,000 or less. The average new home price is now between three hundred dollars to 400000 Longtime North Square residents are priced out of buying the new properties. The median household income is $37,000. Carrera is concerned climate change could widen Philly's equity gap. Originally, you could see a lot of uh, Latinos living in the area of Northern Liberties. Um, we are already um, being gentrified from that area, old area of Fishtown. She hopes local government has a plan. This is an area of climate migration that is generally um, understudied in long-term planning. There's a lot of uncertainty uh, out there in, in the planning process. Uh, 
And so that's that's part of what we're trying to address more and more so. Brett Fusco is with the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. He believes the area can absorb the numbers in Howard's report, but says the agency hasn't fully looked into the issue. However, he does recognize a potential problem. There would definitely be localized hotspots where, where there may be some bigger impacts and implications as a result of climate change, you know, as a result of, of increased migration into the region. And whether the issue is climate change or gentrification, he says the DVRPC wants to keep people in their homes. We want to do more to make sure that people are able to stay in the communities that they, you know, that they're from, that they want to continue to live in, and that they're not being forcibly displaced. I know too many people. Back in Norris Square, Lisa Segarra still worries about saving her home and the neighborhood. What about the people that's here now? People that have stabilized, cleaned this area, fixed it up, and want to be a part of it. The climate crisis could change the way we eat, and that's especially true for some communities of color where a lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables already exists. But NBC10 and Telemundo 62's Jaima Crespo met people using their urban environment to help feed the neighborhood and fight climate change. The only way to do something with the empty lots was to start gardens. For over 30 years, Iris Brown has been a staple in the Norris Square neighborhood in West Kensington. In the 80s, she co-founded Las Parcelas, which means the parcels, that led to a series of urban gardens around her neighborhood. She did it because she saw an unfulfilled need, one Iris is still working to fix. Do you see that in this community, food insecurity and people who need to perhaps uh, have access to fruits and vegetables? Of course, of course, because we all know but in the poor communities, um, it's more diabetes, it's more heart conditions, and it's because of that. Uh, we need to, to be in a garden, we need to grow our own vegetables. The city of Philadelphia says just over 16% of residents go to bed hungry or face food insecurity. That number is most likely even higher because of the pandemic. Many of those impacted, unable to get access to or afford fresh food, are people of color. This is uh, purple cabbage from last year. Iris is being proactive, growing vegetables and spices for her native Puerto Rico and incorporates African plants where her ancestors came from. But she's also keeping an eye on the future and in her own way is fighting against climate change. You see, urban gardens like Iris's produce much needed fresh fruits and vegetables to fight food insecurity, but they also help to combat the impacts of climate change by reducing food related carbon emissions and waste. Those lead to global heating. A lot of people think about transportation and, and think about electricity generation, uh, but the, the reality is a, there's also a significant contribution of methane from organic waste, food wastes uh, in our food supply. Patrick McDonald is the secretary of Pennsylvania's Department of Environmental Protection. He says a quarter of the waste found in landfills is organic food waste. That generates the release of methane, leading to more rapid climate change. And methane is a, a more potent greenhouse gas uh, than, than even carbon dioxide is. The PADEP is providing funding to some nonprofits willing to use food that would become waste. And this is nutritious, healthy food that for otherwise, if we hadn't stepped in, would be thrown away. Phil Abundance is one of them. The food bank helps feed the 850,000 food insecure in Southern Pennsylvania and South Jersey, most of them Black and Latinx. The nonprofit's chief executive officer, Lori Jones, says as climate change impacts the food supply across the world, it has an effect here. And so if there are fires in California, that impacts the availability of food and the price of produce. That impacts the people we serve and their ability to access it. As you can see, there's no room for food waste, but there's steps we can take right now to make a difference. For example, instead of buying a big bag of potatoes, buy the number you need. And rather than throwing away the food scraps, you can turn it into compost to use in a garden or you can donate the waste. You can do that here at the Temple Community Garden, which serves as a compost network in North Philadelphia. Kristen Rice works here. We have uh, six beds or six bins um, and people can drop off their food scraps and we um, bring in like leaves and mulch and that turns into uh, compost, which we can use for the bins, which uh, is used for the produce. That produce is free for the community. 
and you can follow Iris's lead and start your own garden. We need to be creative, and that's what I would like to install in children. 